Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 196. Uh, once again, if all is going as planned, then you should be listening to this, assuming you're listening to this on the weekend of release, at around about the same time that I should be in the air, hopefully somewhere over the Atlantic, making my way home. Nonetheless, the questions this week are taken from the video The Development of Ironclads, the first 10 years in the Royal Navy, the Friday video, a special Friday video for that week on naval art, and guide 244 on the Greek ironclads of the Hydra class. So of course, hail Hydra, and let's begin. Thomas Eitner asks, if a group of Greek merchants wanted to get Greece a couple of battleships directly after World War I to help against Goban, with the caveat of relatively new or newly rebuilt ships, but mostly on the cheap side, how could that be done? Well, there are two problems. Firstly, they're also going to have to be paying for new infrastructure because at the conclusion of World War One, Greece doesn't have a dry dock that's capable of taking something the size of a modern capital ship. That was going to be part of the project that would have been done to have uh, Salamis when that was under order. Now, the other issue is that there's a very tight window where you can pull this off because it has to be post-World War I, but it also has to be pre-1922 because the Washington Treaty forbids the sale or transfer of capital ships to other powers. At which point, in those three or four years, no one's looking to sell brand new ships because, well, brand new ships are basically going to be the Tennessees, the Colorados, the Revengers, the Renowns, and even all of those have seen some kind of active service. Um, at least the British ones have. Hood is brand new, but the British definitely aren't selling her, and so on and so forth. So what you are probably trying to look at is the newest ships that the various powers are willing to sell. Say so the US fleet is in the middle of massive expansion. They're not going to be selling anything relatively new. Certainly nothing perhaps newer than a South Carolina. The German fleet is pretty much all scuttled. The French haven't built anything modern since Britannia. The Italians might sell you Dante Alighieri, or Alighieri, I think, but that, again, that's a, not exactly the world's most modern dreadnought. So it all swings back round again to the British. Now, the British did try and sell Princess Royal to Chile before it ended up being scrapped as a result of the Washington Treaty. And both Lion and Princess Royal were put into reserve before the Washington Treaty. So they weren't seen as um, frontline combatants anymore. Tiger only just about stuck in there. Obviously, Queen Mary had been lost. So... I think the newest ships that you'd be likely to get if this scenario played out and you wanted a couple of capital ships would either be maybe a couple of the Orion class battleships or Lion and Princess Royal. Now obviously both have been patched up Lion to a somewhat greater degree than Princess Royal as a result of service in World War One, but they are both less than 10 years old. They have pretty heavy armaments compared to Goban and well, you could then modernise them in the 1930s. They've got a reasonably useful turn of speed. The main reason I'd go for them over the Orions is that Goban is, of course, a battle cruiser, And if you get a couple of Orions, it can just outrun them. Whereas Goban's sister ship Moltke showed that it couldn't really outrun Lion or Princess Royal. And as far as upgrading them in the 1930s is concerned, again, assuming that the money is there... I'd follow a fairly standard pattern for mid-1930s modernizations, completely replace the power plant with a modern one, uh, maybe uprate the power just a little bit so that you can reliably get 28, 29 knots. That puts you in fast battleship territory. Obviously, you want to upgrade the AA guns. Your main battery is your main battery. Um, obviously, suppress your secondaries, replace the, sec the exist pre-existing secondaries, etc., with some turreted or mounted dual purpose guns and if you've got any space uh, weight left over at that point maybe look at upgrading the armor a little. Luke Dogwalker asks can you discuss the role and composition of the Japanese fleet under Rear Admiral Kozo Sato in World War One and the level of value placed on its contribution by the UK? 
So Admiral Sato commanded the Second Special Squadron. So this was a force of ships that was adv ad activated by the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty in World War One. The Japanese had broken their fleet up into, at the, initially, three main sections, all of which are in, obviously, the Western Pacific. They helped out with uh, Sing Tao. They helped out with scaring Admiral Spey into skedaddling across the Pacific. But you then also had, as the name suggests, two special squadrons, the first and the second, Admiral Sato commanding the second. And the first was a convoy escort squadron that helped convoys get across the Indian Ocean. The second, which is the one that we're concerned with, was a squadron of, of destroyers led by a single small protected cruiser initially, the uh, Akashi. And these ships would subsequently be joined by two other cruisers, the Izumo and the Nishin, both of which were considerably larger than the poor old little Akashi, as well as further destroyers. And they did pretty much the same thing, uh, convoy escort missions in the Mediterranean which was actually very valued by the British for two reasons. One, it obviously meant the British didn't have to commit as many destroyers and cruisers to the Mediterranean, which meant that those cruisers and destroyers could be sent to the Grand Fleet instead, uh, and later on used for other things as well. And also because the Japanese were very good at their job. Um, the Admiralty was actually specifically very appreciative of the quality of work that the Japanese managed to pull off and they managed to do it mostly without too much incident. One of the destroyers was torpedoed, but managed to survive, even though uh, quite a few of the crew died in the impact. Uh, but none of the Japanese ships were actually lost. And by the end of the war, they escorted a considerable number of ships, obviously lots of merchant cargo, but also a lot of troop ships, because remember troop ship movements through the Mediterranean, both east to west, from British Imperial holdings and to British Imperial holdings, as well as north to south from French North Africa to France, were a major part of Mediterranean convoy work. And then they headed home at the end of the war with some prizes in tow because Japan was allocated, amongst other things, uh, from war prize stock, some U-boats. So having spent uh, four years guarding against U-boats, they fetched up back in Japan in 1919 with a bunch of them in tow. Vladimir Stroganov asks, were there any attempts to protect rangefinders and other fragile equipment like rain radar? Was minimising damage to them a concern during their design at all? Not massively, no. For two reasons. One, when you're talking about the main rangefinders and later radars, they have to go very high in the ship at which point you don't really want to be sticking large amounts of armour because that has an outsized effect on the ship's stability compared to the same weight much lower down on the ship. Secondly, with something like radar, if you stick big slabs of metal around it, you've now limited the ability of that radar to actually see things. Um, in, in theory, I guess you could make some kind of almost pencil beam radar that had a, an armoured casing that went round and round, but that comes back to the whole um, problem with weight and stability, especially when you consider the size of a loss of the radar antenna at that point, especially the longer range ones. And similarly with range phones, you know, they're delicate optical instruments. The really delicate things are the lens arrays at either end. Those have to be exposed anyway. Now, the men in the middle, um, if you're in mounting them on a direct control tower, those would tend to have some form of armour, but the armour is to protect the men and to protect the data transmission capabilities of the rangefinder, not the rangefinder itself, because a shell, let's say a six-inch shell or something that hits a particularly heavily armoured direct control tower, it won't kill the men inside and it might not compromise the transmission information transmission of the tower, but it sure as heck is going to break the lenses and prisms at, on the uh, ends of the rangefinders that stuck out at either side. Uh, so it's only really preventing damage, I guess, from things like destroyer caliber shells and splinter splinters. Maybe, maybe the odd casement gun or something like that. On the turrets lower down, quite often they'd have their own rangefinders, and to an extent, obviously, they're also protected by being behind the turret armor. But fundamentally, as an optical system, you have to have those lenses and prisms that make up the either end of a rangefinder, whether it be stereoscopic or coincidence, and those have to be outside in the open. So you 
can't, much like radar, you can't protect the most vulnerable parts of it without, you know, making it impossible for it to do its job. Um, certainly compared to the outsized effect it would have. Because again, the, the, the other thing is you've got to remember these are very, very small targets. Especially then, this is kind of the, the paradox of something high up. It's not particularly well armoured. It's therefore viable to be damaged quite easily if it gets hit. But the fact that it's sticking up in the air means it's relatively unlikely to be damaged by a hit unless it's a direct hit. And a direct hit by a battleship shell is going to total it anyway, no matter what reasonable amount of armour you might put on it. But by being that high up as opposed to somewhere lower down, for example, a turret's rangefinder, if the turret takes a hit, the shock and the splinters on the blast might destroy the rangefinders. But also if the deck or the superstructure near the turret takes a hit, then the splinters and blast from that might also destroy or damage the rangefinders. Whereas if you're right up top, well, there's nothing above you or to the left or right of you to hit. So if a shell passes by three meters away it just passes by and that's it the only time you're going to get splinters and blast is maybe if the tower or the mast directly beneath you gets hit but at that point you've probably got larger issues like the fact the bit that's supporting you has just been blown away rather than any blast effects on that particular rangefinder jason hall asks technological advancements are rather obvious and rapid once we get to the ironclad era and beyond so, what were some major technological advancements in the Age of Sail era, and were any of them drastic enough to render older ships obsolete like Dreadnought did? There were quite a number of major technological advancements in the Age of Sail, um, but in terms of drasticness, yes, they were in some ways it dra enough to make former ships obsolete a bit the, like Dreadnought did to pre-Dreadnoughts, However, because of the slightly slower pace of things in the Age of Sail, and also the fact that in the Age of Sail it was a bit easier to refit older ships with newer technologies up to a certain point, the effect, whilst on paper being as dramatic, in practice wasn't as dramatic. So some of the advancements would be, for example, the discovery of the ability to mass manufacture reliable iron cannon. That made cannon much, much cheaper, and without therefore having to rely on very expensive bronze guns for your um, heavy anti-ship artillery, and then only using iron for the odd piece and mostly for smaller artillery, it now meant that it was plausible not to just to make one or two flagships armed with a lot of guns, but to make lots and lots of ships that were armed with lots and lots of guns, and these guns also being fairly large. So if you look at Age of Sail fleets back when bronze guns were still pretty much the go-to if you wanted something big and powerful, you'll see you'll get a few things like Sovereign of the Seas or Vasa for as long as she lasted, etc. And they'll be flagships, key ships, etc. They'll be armed with almost entirely bronze weapons, or in the case of Vasa, all bronze weapons. But they will be kind of very rare standalones and most most ships in the fleet will have significantly fewer guns whereas once iron gun technology comes in in a big way then all of a sudden you can have huge fleets of you know, 50 or 60 or 70 gun ships with a few slightly larger ships that happen to have slightly more and slightly heavier guns but are of a commonality so whereas in the age where bronze guns were still quite a significant factor you can have something like sovereign of the seas be so powerful that it can almost not quite but almost wander around battlefields unchallenged even when mobbed by multiple ships a first-rate ship of the line by the time of nelson whilst yes it can conceive of quite easily and conceivably take on a third rate and batter it into the ground if a first rate is attacked by three or four third rates, it's going to losing fight pretty darn quickly. So that's one thing. Another thing would be the introduction of triangular or latine masts, uh, or sails more accurately, which were then placed on the yards, which were placed on the masts, because this gave ships a lot more agility and maneuverability and ability to sail much closer to the wind. So in previous at least northern European generations of ships, when 
vessels had just had square masts, uh, sorry, square sails, so very good at running with the wind or slightly off the wind, but turning into the wind being a much more difficult proposition, uh, introducing these lateen sails at least partially. Uh, they didn't rig up first rates and third rates, etc., fully with lateen sails, but by having triangular fore and aft sails coming off the bowsprit, between the bowsprit and the foremast, between the various masts, and on quite a number of ships also on the mizzen mast, it meant those ships were a lot more agile in a lot more different directions, which gave them a significant advantage. The only thing obviously being that it's not a massive ask to reconfigure older ships with at least some degree of that technology, at least in uh, compared to you know re-engining a steam-powered vessel or something like that. And then probably the last thing I want to mention in this particular little dry dock answer would be the advances of Seppings and Simmons uh, and their equivalent peers who took after them in various other foreign navies at the start of the 19th century. Shell guns were a thing that were coming in in dribs and drabs, but the initial unreliability of shells means that whilst shell guns, once they got fully established, were you know a dominant weapon it wasn't really a decisive switch one from one day to the next or even one year to the next, whereas Seppings and Simmons designs, which enabled you to use diagonal cross pieces that were a lot shorter than the previous long timbers, as well as use iron strapping and rounded bows and sterns, all meant that ships became a lot, lot stronger, which meant they could also be a lot, lot larger. And that, of all the things, probably led to the most flat-out obsolescence of previous ships, because, you know, you could rearm older ships with iron guns. You could refit older ships with lateen sails. You couldn't make an older ship 50% larger. And that's what the Seppings and Simmons designs allowed for. Apart from the fact they could be made cheaper, you know, a first rate by the end of the Age of Sail era was 130 to 150 guns, and those guns were big, um, almost uniformly. And second rates were two decker 90 to 100 gun ships again, with very large guns that their new stronger decks were capable of supporting. And though that was just flat out better than an 1800s, 1810s first rate, which might be anything from 100 to 120 guns or so, because not only were they you know, outgunned by 20 to 40 guns, but those guns, as I said, were individually considerably larger than the majority of weapons that the previous first rates had had. Plus, obviously, being larger, they can the newer ships can soak up damage better, and being stronger hold, they can absorb the damage better there as well. So that's probably the single largest shift change in sort of the 1500 to 1850 period when it comes to the Age of Sail, which obsoletes vast numbers of older vessels. We Say No to Pay to Win asks, how often did navies train on guns and fighting tactics? Did it change and become more or less common from the golden age of sail to World War II? There isn't really any single answer, because even in specific time periods, the level and frequency of training varies massively. So, for example, in the Napoleonic Wars, one of the major problems with the Franco-Spanish fleets was that it didn't get much training in at all, whereas its British counterparts got in quite a lot of training. But then even when you break it down into individual fleets, it's not reliable because in the age of sail, captains had a lot more leeway about how much training they wanted to do or not do. So um, sticking with that time period, you see in, for example, the War of 1812, HMS Macedonian, doesn't really do a tremendous amount of practice beforehand. It does what the Navy requires, but nothing further. Whereas HMS Shannon, a captain broke there, absolutely hammers his crew to within an inch of their lives with battle practice. They're both ships in the British Navy. They're both fighting in the same conflict within a year or two of each other, but they are in remarkably different ships when it comes to their battle readiness. And, you know, so just as you could have some British ships that were trained to the absolute edge of perfection and other British ships that were really a bit lacklustre, but overall the British fleet was re reasonably good. Likewise, whilst the overall standard of something like the French Navy at that time period wasn't exactly anything to write home about, there were individual captains who did train their ships and were very, very capable, just as 
capable as many of their British counterparts and cap- and therefore able to throw down with them. One of the... And then, of course, you've got the other thing, especially in the Age of Sail, which is that boarding and gunnery and sailing are three very, very different aspects of warship operation. So you can have a ship that's actually not especially good at gunnery at all, but is fantastic at fighting a boarding operation, fighting in close combat, like, say, Redoutable at Trafalgar. And as the freedom of captains gets curtailed somewhat as you transition through into the powered era of steam and iron and so steel and so forth you have fewer ships in general and they're much more complex and so whilst battle practice becomes a little bit more standardized across the fleet it also therefore will become less common in some areas more common in others within the same fleet and the scale of the fleet training and exercises will also be highly variable. So, for example, um, the Channel Fleet in the 1860s and the 1870s did semi-regular fleet battle exercises, um, you know, mostly to scare off the French. The Mediterranean Squadron, which, apart from other things, tended to receive a lot of the experimental British vessels, would do almost ad hoc gunnery training as well as having an occasionally regularly scheduled practice and then when you get into the 20th century you can have individual captains training their crews up to a certain point because they've only got a certain amount of um, practice ammunition and it's a little bit more dangerous to to use than perhaps say an age of sail cannon would be and then you've got squadrons that might do their own exercises that might be tailored towards their current mission role. You would have practice and gunnery exercises and fleet manoeuvres at a fleet level um, in wartime and in peacetime. But again, that would be confined a lot by circumstance. So in wartime, the being in Scapa flow for the most part and having access to the North Sea as the sort of holder of the terrain, meant that the Royal Navy had a fair bit of time for gunnery practice, unless you happen to be stuck in the Firth of Forth and you were the battlecruiser fleet. Whereas the Germans, whilst they could go to the Baltic, and so on and so forth, had, were much more constrained in what they could do in terms of sailing out and, and practicing things. In peacetime, you know, the US with its fleet concentrated usually mostly in one or the other theater whether that be the atlantic or the pacific was able to run fleet problem exercises that involved significant chunks of their fleet whereas the british still scattered between home mediterranean etc etc fleets their fleets would have their own training schedules except for the occasional time when a good chunk of the royal navy would meet up and have a big exercise so yeah it's Whilst it changes, it's not exactly something that can be easily quantified because the trends between nations are very, very different. One nation might have lots of exercises in the steam and steel period and virtually none in the Age of Sail and vice versa. And the frequency and effectiveness of them might also vary massively depending on, you know, the time and the place. James Harding asks, can you tell us a little more about the radio navigation system being introduced in the early 20s, as referenced in the Honda Point video? Was it one of the first such systems, or were they reasonably prolific by then? Forms of radio navigation had actually been worked out by the 1900s, and things progressed through the 1910s, but they weren't especially prolific before World War I. A mixture of the advances caused by World War I and technological advances in general meant that a lot of the problems with having very large antenna or being only able to pick up very certain frequencies were solved and the whole system became a lot more compact and a lot easier to use by the beginning of the 1920s which was then when you started to see the systems deployed in considerably larger numbers and that's why the Honda Point um, disaster involved a system that was relatively newly set up but in terms of how they worked the very early radio direction finding systems for navigation would work on the basis that well the ship had a magnetic compass so it knew which way was north and then 
the ground station, which was your navigation beacon, would have a rotating signal, so it could cover full 360. And then you had your receiving aerial, and your receiving aerial would obviously pick up the signal best when it was facing directly at the incoming signal as it swept round. So you'd have, it w- It wasn't an instant thing, but you'd have to listen for it as the signal swept round, and you think, okay, right, well, I've heard, and usually these things would have, like, uh, Morse code beats or something. So you think, okay, I've heard that, but, you know, if I adjust the aerial five degrees left and listen for it on its next sweep around, now what do I hear? Oh, okay, now the signal's a bit clearer. And now? And how about now? And you could also have consistent, uh, constant transmission signals, which uh, it depended on what kind of radio navigation station you were using. But anyway, the point was that you would adjust your receiving aerial until you had the strongest possible reception. And then you'd check, okay, well, you know, let's say I know that north is this way, um, and therefore I know that my ship is heading at 130 degrees off of north, and... I get the best signal from this particular uh, station, which its Morse code pattern identifies as being at this location, when my antenna is tuned 10 degrees off of the port bow. So, if, And then obviously you can work out uh, from that what the bearing to this station is, and then you can run a line and go, okay, well, we're somewhere along this line from this station, and then you find another station in another direction and you go, OK, well, we're, we're somewhere along this line from this station and where those two lines intersect, that's where you are. Um, it's it's a little, little clunky, but fairly easy to do, uh, especially considering the technology at the time. Obviously, later on, um, the systems will become more compact and more precise as as time went on. But it was pretty good for what it was initially. Basic triangulation, effectively. Knight6831 asks, if HMS Ark Royal hadn't been sunk by U-81 in November 1941, then when would she have been decommissioned? Well, if we're acting on the assumption that her being not being sunk by U-81 means that she's also not sunk or incredibly badly damaged for the rest of the war, and she survives the war, then her being decommissioned, I think, would largely depend on one major thing, which is what is her mechanical condition at that point, um, i.e. are her engines and machinery completely shot? Is she a worn-out ship? Or, potentially, has she had a refit? Because, bearing in mind, obviously, she's the oldest purpose-designed fleet carrier still in the Royal Navy by the in this scenario where she survived by the mid part of the war Hermes has been sunk um, Courageous and Glorious have been sunk Furious is not a purpose design carrier Eagle's also not a purpose design carrier nor is Argus you get the picture she's although slightly less in displacement she is still actually somewhat larger than an illustrious class so she does have that advantage but um the main thing, as I say, with the mechanics is perhaps if she, if she's mechanically worn by 1944, and obviously the Allies are anticipating quite a long campaign against Japan, the British are going to be looking going, well, we do need a fair number of carrier aircraft out there. Ark Royal can carry more aircraft than an illustrious class can, even though the illustrious class is technically speaking a thousand tons heavier by in terms of displacement, they are considerably shorter. Uh, than the Ark Royal was. So they, the British might pull her in in 44 as the Kriegsmarine threat winds down, the Italian threat's no longer there. And let's assume that she's had a full machinery refit, so she's pretty much good to go, um, going into the last part of the war and then into the post-war environment. With that out the way, as I said, not only has she got a longer flight deck than the illustrious class does, but her hangar is also somewhat taller. Well, both hangers, actually, because she's a double-stack uh, hangar carrier. That's why she's so tall. Now, she's not quite there with an Essex class with its 17, 17 and a half foot high hangar, but at 16 foot, her hangar is considerably taller than the 14 foot you find on an illustrious. And one of the biggest problems with keeping the illustrious class around in the post-war environment wasn't just... It wasn't just the flight decks because you know victorious was kept around for quite a long time it was 
the you know you just physically couldn't fit certain aircraft in a 14 foot high hangar the way that the US could with the Essex class with its higher hangar now Ark Royal has greater aircraft carrying capacity in the first place it has a higher hangar than the illustrious is and also since she's not an armored flight deck carrier she would probably be considerably easier to modify than victorious was so assuming that her machinery is either not completely shot or has been more likely recently replaced in a po in a late war refit i could actually see arc royal sticking around for a long time she'd probably significantly outlast the illustrious class because she offers more capability to the royal navy She'd probably then be the test bed for the angled flight deck instead of victorious. And that in turn might lead to the illustrious class going and maybe an angled flight deck arc royal with the refit not being quite the disaster the victorious's was being joined perhaps by a angled flight deck implacable and indefatigable along with the or the two audacious's. Uh, eagle and now you're gonna have to find something else to call the other one um so she might well actually be around into the late 50s or even the early 60s in a slightly weird turn of events but of course the flip side is she could just be completely mechanically shot at the end of the war and just decommissioned shortly thereafter as a non-viable unit either or Mike Hall asks, can you give some sources for the actual results of the investigations carried out into armour and guns in the late 1850s and early 1860s? In particular, are any of the original reports available online? I've searched, but Google has not proved to be my friend at all, and all i found are a few articles from the Minutes of Proceedings of the Royal Artillery Institution, Volume 3, 1861-1863, which gives some interesting, although not too helpful, tabulations that are a bit late for the development of Warrior. I was hoping to find some documentation of your accounts with of the high quality of the 68 pounder smoothbore and also what shot was used in the 68 pounder when it was fired at armor presumably they didn't simply use round shot or would anything else tumble in flight so there's a couple of ways of finding the sources first would be if you want individual sources the easiest way to summarize it in something like the dry dock would be to say look at something like warrior to dreadnought or possibly before the ironclad two books by dk brown which will mention in a reasonable amount of detail in passing the tests and experiments but he's very very good about footnoting and side noting which admiralty documents they're from which you can then request copies of from q or if you happen to be in the uk possibly even visit q to see them yourself and that'll give you specifically with the 68 pounder stuff um, a lot of information but that is obviously you'll need different record numbers for individual tests and so on and so forth the other thing um, which you can do is either google for or just email me and i'll send you a pdf of because it's free it's been digitized and scanned and it's way out of copyright uh, a rather wonderful if almost thousand page document which in classic victorian style this was published in 1864 uh, 1864 and 1865 it's part called a treatise on ordnance and armor embracing descriptions discussions and professional opinions concerning the material fabric fabrication requirements capabilities and endurance of european and american guns for naval sea coast and ironclad warfare and their rifling projectiles and breech loading also results of experiments against armor from official records all with an appendix referring to gun cotton hooped guns etc etc by alexander l holly bp with 493 illustrations published in new york by d van van nostrand 192 broadway and in london by trubner and company 1865 and as i mentioned it is an exhaustive document um it's ordering of things could perhaps leave something to be desired to the modern mind there is a order to what it's what it's uh, actually telling you but it's an order which is fitting with the flow of the narrative of the document not necessarily strictly in a chronological order like we would perhaps prefer um for example uh, in section two it deals with heavy shot at low velocities so that's looking at a lot of american guns things like the 15 inch uh, dahlgrens etc then it looks at solid and laminated armor um and in that it, this is still within the heavy shot low velocity section and there it's talking it 
covers a number of the 68 pounder and 110 pounder experiments against later targets the post warrior targets but in the earlier experimental section it talks about shots on the warrior target and then section three small shot at high velocities goes through the warrior target again both in terms of at the time of publication more modern guns i.e mid 1860s guns slightly larger weapons but also then goes over the 68 pounder again um then it looks at the two systems combined, breaching masonry, resistance to elastic pressure effects of heat, elasticity, ductility, cast iron, wrought iron. When basically, every time it covers a section, steel, um, where there's a relevant experiment, it will cover it. So you'll find, six, if you're looking at the 68 pounder, the 68 pounder is mentioned in multiple experiments throughout the work. And then there's a bunch of stuff also that covers some of the earlier experiments. So whilst a lot of it is covering so 1858 through 1864, there are sections that talk about earlier experiments as well because it's attempting to collect basically everything that's been known about armour and guns up until that point, including some of the early experiments with 68-pounder um, guns and so forth against warriors' armour. So, yeah, as I say, either Google that if you really, really want to type it all in, um, or you can just, let's say, email me and I'll send you a PDF copy. So, um, <laughs> helpfully, in part of the second experiments against armour, they do actually have a chronological listing of the various armour experiments. So, going all the way back to 1812 experiments in the US, um, and then again, if you're looking at the 68 pound in particular, then you've got um, cast iron block experiments in 1857, four inch iron steel experiments in 1856 and 1857, firing into the water in 1857, a comparison of 68 pounders and 32 pounders, as well as with eight inch guns against plate in 1858, a Thornycroft 14 inch target in 1859, special committee, the Admiralty Committee that's quite often referenced in 1859, which works against various plates, Tr the trusty experiment, um, that was a shot against eight HMS, uh, several shots against HMS Trusty, which have been refitted with armor for the experiments. Then you have the four and a half inch plate test by the Armstrong gun in 1859, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Um, the warrior target in England in 1861 is covered on page 669, um, goes on for several pages on that, etc. Um, and the warrior target gets mentioned repeatedly because it gets used in a lot of different experiments. So you've not just got the 1861 experiments, you've got the previous ones. You've also got another one that was done using 6-inch and 10-inch laminated shields as well as the warrior target in 1862. Uh, there's another committee test uh, on the warrior in warrior's target in 1862. Then Whitworth uses shells against a warrior target in 1862, a horseful gun in 1862 also against a warrior target. Y you get the idea. It's even being used in St. Petersburg in 1863. Bifi Commander asks, why did the British use 7 and 8 inch guns or 8 and 9 inch guns on the same ship? It sounds like too small a jump in shell size to justify the extra headache of using, supplying and maintaining multiple different weapons. There were a number of reasons. Partly, gun technology was advancing so quickly that it wasn't necessarily guaranteed that one particular gun would work very well. The Royal Navy had obviously been stung by modifying warriors designed to include the Armstrong 110 pounders, and then they hadn't worked very well. So some of it was gambling against one or the other gun failing. Another part of it was that some guns were particularly good at firing shells and other guns were particularly good at firing shot. Something Sometimes that was to do with the construction of the barrel. Some of them were still smooth bore, some were rifled, uh, some were longer barreled, some were shorter barreled, etc. Um, also, the, and related to that, the muzzle velocity. So you might have a larger shell firing gun that maybe has a lower muzzle velocity, but the slightly smaller gun made by a different manufacturer might have a higher velocity and is therefore better for armour penetration. And if you have a mixture of both, then you have, in theory, some of the best of both as opposed to a gun that might be really good at punching through armour, but actually not so good at blowing up wooden ships, or a broadside that's really good at blowing away old wooden ships, but would struggle against an enemy armoured ship, so instead you go for both. Part of it is also just the fact that um, 
they wanted the heaviest possible armament for a given role, but if you can get, let's say, like you, let's say you can get three or four guns on a broadside, if you make them just a fraction smaller, but then you've got maybe a couple of guns bound stern or uh, fore and aft in a, in a central battery, and so you your size limitations on those positions is slightly less. Well, then you might as well go for a slightly larger gun because then it hits a little bit harder. Because um, bear in mind, you're coming in from an era where, you know, a first-rate ship of the line, which is effectively what these ironclads are replacing, in Nelson's period would have 32-pounder, 24-pounder, 18-pounder, 12-pounder, and 68-pounder balls aboard. So the idea of having two sizes of shell, or maybe three, is actually still a simplification compared to what it used to be. And sometimes, given that a lot of these ships came in one-offs or classes of two, it was sometimes purely experimental. So the larger battery might reflect the gun that the Royal Navy was confident in, and the fewer but larger guns might reflect a gun the Royal Navy is also confident in but doesn't have much sea experience with. So if they're building one ship, they might go, OK, well, um, we know our main battery is going to be this. But let's stick a couple of these newer, bigger guns on and see how they do. See if it's worth having them as the main battery of our next design, which is a relatively practical way of doing things, because ultimately, thanks to the fact that these things are still either broadside ironclads or central battery ironclads for the most part, if one or the other doesn't work out, it's not anywhere near as difficult to just replace those guns further down the line as it is once you get into turret-mounted weaponry. Ferris asks, Given that range finding is made easier with more salvos fired, would it have been more effective for the North Carolina class to be completed with the quad 14-inch turrets as originally designed? Using hindsight, we know Washington would have overmatched Kirishima with either armament, but considering that she spent a good chunk of her time doing shore bombardment, I wonder if the extra three guns would have made them more effective gunnery ships, or they might have been able to dial the range in sooner. What are your thoughts? It's one of those slightly odd things wherein at the time of their construction it made perfect sense to change the design to triple sixteens because they thought they might have to face off against Bismarck's, Latorios, whatever the Yamato might turn out to be, etc. But in hindsight, as you mentioned, the only time they ever shot another capital ship was Washington versus Kirishima, and as again, as you pointed out, you know, 12 14 inch guns would have made just as much, if not more, of a mess of Kirishima as 9 16 inch guns. And outside of that, yeah, having 12 guns instead of 9 loaded up with HE probably would have made uh, for a slightly better shore bombardment vessel because you're landing more individual explosions. I mean, not to be slightly morbid, but there is a reason why modern nuclear warfare for killing cities uses multiple smaller impacts instead of one much larger impact. It's just more efficient. In terms of range finding, for the most part of the US involvement in the war, it wouldn't matter too much whether you had the 16s or the 14s because um, it's going to be using radar to estimate the range. So it doesn't really make too much odds. But for the very earliest stages of the war where the radar resolution isn't quite good enough for that and you might in a theoretical daytime combat be doing optical spotting or in cases of shore bombardment where you know the ground might get in the way of your radar range estimations then sure having more guns would help because as we've discussed before four guns is really your ideal minimum for a salvo you can get away with three but four is better and if obviously if you have three quadruple turrets then you have three sets of ideal salvo sized range finding data to launch out Loch Ness Hamster asks did any nation or kingdom allow women to serve on warships on a regular basis during the time period the channel covers were there any female admirals or captains, not counting pirates or other non-state warships? As a rule of thumb, no. Nations and kingdoms tended not to have women serving on warships in a regular capacity. There are always exceptions, of course. Um, so if you go back to ancient times, if the person in charge was a queen instead of a king at the, that particular time period that they were in, involved in a war, then the queen would 
lead her ships because she was the queen. Um, and no one was really going to try arguing with that and if they liked keeping their heads. But in terms of female captains, female officers, or, or you know, female crew, that tended to be mostly the domain of, as you mentioned, pirates and other non-state actors. Jean de Clisson, for example, in the Channel, um, basically going on a, on a one-woman and fleet rampage against the French, uh, even though she was technically French, but you know, the French king had annoyed her, so she decided to burn a lot of his holdings to make him even more annoyed. And, and as I said, there probably are a few cultures out there who made exceptions, but for the vast majority of seafaring cultures, for the vast majority of the time that the channel covers, regular naval crew would be an all-male occupation. Um certainly for the last thousand years or so. Obviously, the further back you go, the lower the population count is for any particular nation, the less and less picky they can be about things. But, you know, age of sail up to the 1950s, etc., is very much an all-male environment, officially. Um, unofficially, there were usually a reasonable number of women on any ship that had a significant amount of crew aboard, but that is a different matter. Um, a few notable exceptions, slightly closer to the time period than you might imagine, for example, would be, say, the Swedish Navy around the time of Vasa. Um, their crew were allowed to have their families aboard. So although it's kind of a halfway house, the the women aren't there as officially paid, enrolled sailors with an opportunity to climb the ranks but they are officially allowed on board, as opposed to in many other navies of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, where officially, as I said, they're not allowed on board, but unofficially, there are usually a few that get quietly overlooked. Eric Paslik asks, In a previous dry dock, you were asked how best USS Atlanta could have survived during the naval battle of Guadalcanal. Your response, if memory serves, was not to be there. If I recall correctly, the Atlanta-class design started as a destroyer or flotilla leader before the U.S. decided they weren't interested in that idea, and then they were repurposed as anti-aircraft cruisers. Given the above, how do you think Atlanta would have done if she'd deployed with the destroyers instead of the cruisers? She had a massive amount of destroyer-sized armament, including torpedo tubes, and thin as her armour was, she was still a little bit better protected than the destroyers. Also, what were the destroyer casualty-survival rates during Guadalcanal? Well, one has to remember that there was another Atlanta-class cruiser present at the first night action of uh, the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal that was effectively with the destroyers. That would be Juno. And Juno didn't come off particularly brilliantly. I mean, she did obviously initially hold her own, but the Japanese had better and longer-range torpedoes, and she took a torpedo and was forced to withdraw, and then she was finished off uh, by the Japanese the following day. So whilst, yes, if Atlanta had been deployed to the rear with the destroyer, with some destroyers, not all of them, but with some of them, then, yeah, she could have taken on and shot up a bunch of Japanese destroyers, potentially, but she could also have shared Juno's fate of just being nailed by long lances fairly quickly. And then, of course, you have other things like um, that particular year's iteration of USS Laffey, which ended up being sunk eventually, but at one point scraped, almost near enough, scraped down the side of one of the Japanese battle cruisers, surviving that encounter largely because she was too small for the Japanese to fire their main guns at, because she was so close. Whereas Atlanta, being a substantially larger vessel, probably would have received some point-blank fire from the battle cruiser's main and secondary batteries, which wouldn't have ended well. That there is no really good place to be for being a US ship in the uh, first night action of Guadalcanal. And as for the destroyer casualty and survival rates, well, the US goes into that battle with eight destroyers, they come out with four, and two of them are fairly badly shot up. Now, as for casualties, it varies a bit. So you look at uh, the ones that were sunk, at least. USS Monson, she has 276 men aboard, at least notionally. About 40% of them survive. So you're looking at 60% fatality rate. And then obviously of that 40%, there's a fair number wounded. But at the same time, you have uh, USS Cushing, also sunk in the action. She has 158 um, aboard. And of those, just under half, 
are killed or missing in action, and obviously a substantial amount are wounded, so slightly lower casualty rate on that ship. USS Laffey herself has 247 crew aboard, of which 59 are killed, so you're looking at about 25% fatality rate on that ship. The flip side is that there are 116 wounded, so you're looking at almost 50% of the original crew being wounded, so about 25% of the crew are not killed or wounded in on board Laffey. And then you have Barton, which um, takes 164 of her crew with her, and then there are 68 survivors. So that almost is flipped around from, from Laffey, where about a quarter of the crew die and three quarters survive, albeit two thirds of those are wounded. On Barton, three quarters of the crew are dead and only a quarter survive, uh, and it's not immediately clear how many of them were wounded. So if you're looking at averaging it out across the four destroyers that were sunk, you're looking at about probably 50% dead and uh, probably about 60 to 65 percent of the survivors wounded. Then you have Sterrett and Aaron Ward which are damaged but not sunk. They have casualties aboard but obviously far less casualties than the the sunken vessels and then you have O'Bannon and Fletcher which weren't particularly heavily damaged and therefore their casualty counts are even lower. So broadly speaking um, for that action, as I said, for the s ships that are sunk, your or the destroyers that are sunk, you're probably looking at about 50% casualties and then uh, two-thirds wounded of the survivors. For the damaged vessels, you're looking at maybe a 10% fatality rate and 20, 25% wounded, and then kind of luck of the draw on the ships that are, un that are practically undamaged. John McDonough asks, I've just finished the audio version of The Battle for Spain with Anthony Beaver, 2006, about the Spanish Civil War, 1936-39. to It was not a major naval war by any measure, but it had several interesting naval aspects which I think might be of interest. My question involves the role of the British fleet, specifically the one at Gibraltar. According to the author, the admiral in charge of that fleet acted of his own accord to, if not directly aid the nationalists, then certainly hinder the operations of the republicans. He did this without orders from or even reference to the Admiralty or the government as a sort of junior achievement Kuangtang army. Is there any truth to this? Overall British policy, as with so many times when civil wars are involved, seems to be very hodgepodge and fragmentary. The government as a whole tended to slightly favour the nationalists, i.e. Franco's side, over the republicans, and did make certain allowances that, whilst officially the policy was completely neutral, non-intervention, were fairly definitively slightly pro-nationalist. Obviously not quite to the same degree that the Italians and the Germans were, but still, um, I think trying to claim Britain was completely neutral during the Spanish Civil War would be a, a fairly blatant lie. Now... The way you have to offset that against is the fact that, as again with so many of these kinds of conflicts, the stance of the British government and the stance of the British public were two very different things. Um, and on a third stance, it was the businesses. Uh, public opinion was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more divided than the governmental overall favour of the nationalists and the. British merchant shipping was mostly interested in how can we make the maximum amount of money out of all of this. And so you had various British merchant ships um, supplying both sides. And then you had this slightly weird dichotomy where officially the government and therefore technically the Navy was acting slightly more in favour of the Nationalists than the Republicans, but equally the Royal Navy would intervene to prevent Republican um ships and so forth interfering with British uh, trading and it also would prevent nationalist ships from interfering with British trading because regardless of any politi particular political alignment one way or the other in a notionally non-interventionist stance it was much more important that British shipping should remain unmolested you know sovereignty and all that 
etc etc so it is a little bit all over the place now as far as whether or not the admiral in charge of the fleet at gibraltar acted without orders or reference from the admiralty or the government i mm, for the, for local specific interventions like seeing off nationalist or republican ships that were going after convoys that were supplying the other side obviously that comes under his general remit of protect british shipping and officially enforce neutrality so he wouldn't need orders from on high to do that when it comes to other things like for example um it's said um mostly to be honest in anthony beaver's uh, book on the subject which is where most of most of this information comes from at least uh, for this question that things like queen elizabeth was deliberately put in place that that's the battleship um in order to prevent the republicans shelling a nationalist held port that kind of thing and passing along information that would need some kind of clearance higher up the question there is whether or not that clearance was officially given or whether it was kind of back channel state secret style orders and given that well we're talking about the late 30s so near enough near enough as makes no difference 1940 so if things were still classified under the old 90 year rule on that basis well 60 years to 2000 then another 30 years so in theory if there were back channel orders as opposed to official ones and i suspect if there aren't records of official ones then there probably were some back channel orders given we aren't probably going to see anything about it for at least another six to eight years um because well you can imagine the even the current british government probably doesn't want to deal with a media uproar that you can see the the news media writing you know british given that we now know what the kind of shenanigans franco got up to after he got power you could just imagine the newspaper headlines you know british government in 1930s supported fascist coup in in spain um which even if it's even if it was true the current government definitely would want to um to, to see splashed across the front page of the times or whatever alfred mullet asks was there ever any case or in history or of specific pieces of music being associated or adopted by specific ships over and above the basic national or service pieces yes plenty of ships and subs did adopt unofficial anthems for themselves of various types um obviously you had you'd have the national anthem you'd have the various naval anthems and songs and then quite often especially if ships were uh, uh, at sea for quite a long time the crew and the officers would usually settled on one or two songs that they thought most closely represented themselves and the ship and lots of ships would then play them at various points whether they when they were just cruising around maybe when they were going to go into battle maybe when they were just sitting in port and wanted to entertain themselves or entertain other ships but there have been there's been a long long history of various vessels and even squadrons adopting unofficial anthems and music uh, for themselves which has led to the occasional bit of um shall we say interesting encounters between various ships crews when two ships end up in port where they've both chosen the same unofficial anthem and they decide to settle it the good old sailor's way to work out which ship gets to keep it daniel silverthorne asks years back a friend of mine brought a plan brought up a plan that imperial japan had for a trio of ironclads with a novel idea two of the ships would carry only a single high caliber turret forward and the third ship would carry the same turret mounted aft the ships would then operate in a unified squadron in line abreast to allow for massive firepower forward without leaving their stern vulnerable i've never been able to find anything concrete about these ships could you shed some light on this it sounds to me like a slightly garbled version of the description of the matsushima class protected cruisers because that near enough 
matches the description you give. So the Matsushima class was planned to be four, turned out to be three. They rebuilt uh, the last one, uh, Kitsushima, as a slightly different design. But of the three that were actually constructed, you had Itsukushima and Hashidate, which had were as a protected cruiser, so not quite ironclads, but near enough the same era. And as you can see, they had a single massive battleship grey 320mm or 12.6 inch gun mounted forward. And aft was just smaller 4.7 inch 120mm guns. Matsushima has her main gun aft and all the secondaries forward. And it's a bit odd they named the class after the Matsushima because obviously um, Itsukushima and Hashidate are the majority of the class and they're the other way around, but never mind. And yes, the three ships were meant to operate together, with the first two forward and Matsushima following, thus making a weird kind of three-hull battleship layout, with uh, obviously Matsushima's aft-mounted gun covering the aft of the line. So not line abreast, but uh, a column. As it turned out, the idea actually didn't work very well at all. Um, sailing the ships around in a column to engage single vessels proved to be impractical, and... Uh, individually, the rates of fire on the massive guns fitted to small hulls turned out to be pretty pathetic, so the Japanese gave up the idea. I mean, it was kind of an ultimate extension of some of the Je Nicole principles. They had Emile Bertin over to help design them, but it was soon after that, and the fact that the only reason they even held their own in the battles they did engage in was because it was the Sino-Japanese War what season Twenty or something like that in the late 19th century so the Chinese weren't really up to doing that much in reply that meant they stayed afloat at all and the Japanese started shifting over to a slightly more conventional model based on the Royal Navy thereafter. And that concludes this episode of The Dry Dock thank you very much for listening if everything's going to plan at the time of release I should be somewhere in the skies over the Atlantic heading back home so let's hope all of that goes well and I'll see you again in another video or possibly a live stream.